Dear God, you come to us in the night and you trouble us. We are not perfect vessels. Still, O oh God, use us, we are willing. When you created the world, you called it good. You called us good. Help us to remember the goodness you see in us and in the world. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dream incubation is what we had in our scripture today. It was a type of ancient Near Eastern divination. The one who wanted to have a vision or to hear from God would sleep in the temple near the Ark of the Covenant until they got something. This makes a lot of sense to me because sometimes God troubles me at night. I'm kept up. Wondering, thinking, turning to prayer, even if the prayer is, Lord, let me sleep. Samuel was lying in the temple of Yahweh, sort of like a church sleepover. He was sleeping near the ark. And when the revelation comes that he has been waiting for, that people have set him up for, Neither he nor Eli know what is going on. Isn't that the case with us? We aren't always so clear when God comes to us. Three distinct separate times while little Samuel is sleeping in the temple, Samuel hears a voice and runs to Eli and says, Here I am. Eli is sort of like a grandfather character, a priest of the temple. And Eli tells Samuel to go back to bed. It wasn't me calling you. You didn't hear that voice. Go back to sleep. Samuel is a child of promise, someone who might be a great leader or bring clarity to the people of Israel. One does not have to be a child, though, or young, to hear God's call. It is never too late. One is never too sleep-deprived or too old or too distracted to turn toward God again. What a relief that Samuel doesn't get it right on the first time. But God keeps coming to him until he says, Speak, for your servant is listening. Listening for a call requires a certain amount of optimism. Samuel lay there until morning, and when he heard the vision, he was afraid to tell Eli, because it wasn't all good news. But Eli, wise with comfort, someone able to hold conflict, persuaded him to share. Sharing our call or our vision requires optimism, too, because it feels unusual, vulnerable. It's not what we thought our life would be about. It's not the prescribed rhythm. It is marching to the beat of our own drum. Samuel brings to Eli the difficult news. He says, there will be judgment on this house because the people of it has, have been disobeying God and no one called them on it. And Eli, encountering this hard truth, reflects and says, it is the Lord. Let God do what seems good to God. Hearing God's call, listening for God's voice is like listening for a distant drum. Tell me, is anyone else kept up at night? This is often where I believe God speaks to us, maybe like three in the morning. <laughs> something troubles us. Something brings us awake. 
Is that God calling something to our attention? Imagine also if we were to do dream incubation, if we were to sleep in a place like this, what sort of dreams would God give us? What kind of calls would God have on our lives? Over 350 years ago, a religious sect from England that we now know as the Puritans, they were troubled by God in their sleep. They heard from God a different rhythm. And they were so convicted by that rhythm that they took to the sea and traveled across an ocean to an unknown land. They founded churches and communities like this one. We have their boldness and their perseverance in our church DNA, and we celebrate that today. 350 years ago, founders of this church set into motion a community that has continued to this very moment. We are the dreams of these ancestors in faith. 100 years ago, on our 250th anniversary, the Reverend Azel Washburn Hazen, here he is, he's right here, I'm going to bring him up here. <laughs> he was pastor here for nearly 50 years. He wrote a history of the first church of Christ and states that there are only 16 churches older than us in Connecticut, only 25 churches older than us in Massachusetts, and only one in New Hampshire and nowhere else in the United States is there a church older than us. It's pretty amazing, right? I hope that these ancestors have not dreamed in vain because we are still here, caring for the common good in Middletown. The Founders set a rhythm forth 350 years ago, and today we do celebrate that rhythm. We listen for it. And part of being a resilient and authentic community is also being honest about when we didn't hear the rhythm, when we didn't get it right, because we are imperfect vessels trying our best, but all often missing the mark, having to be called back to God in the night. So as we celebrate this year, we also hold in tension the things, looking back, that we wish had not happened, things we are not proud of, such as the direct conflict the founders of this church had with Native Americans in this area. We inhabit stolen land, and we have that in our legacy as well. Not every rhythm set forth is a rhythm to follow, but I deeply believe that being part of a resilient and authentic community is to look at ourselves honestly and say, we were complicit in that rather than only understand ourselves as good. Hazen's book cites this conflict that our church was born out of. He was honest about it 100 years ago. What does that mean for us today? I don't have the answer to that, but I pose the question. In a few weeks on February 11th, to begin Lent, which is actually begins on Valentine's Day, and, and Easter is on um, April Fool's Day. <laughs> so this is like a fun little container of secular holidays for our season of 350 years. But to begin Lent, we have Debbie Shapiro, who is in charge of the Historical Society in Middletown. She's going to come here at 4 o'clock after church. Yeah and talk to us about the vanished port exhibit that she has at the Middlesex Historical Society, which shows that Middletown and those of this church 
earned much of our money on the buying and selling of sugar and rum linked to the work and trade of enslaved human beings here and in the Caribbean. We as an institution were part of that. What does that mean for us? I don't have the answers, but I pose the question. So today on our kickoff celebration, I want to ask you, what dreams does this temple incubate for you? What troubles you in the night? What is the guiding rhythm of your life? What is the drum beat that you hear that is unpopular? How is God calling you now to co-create for the common good? And I wanted to share, when I was away in Arizona at a clergy retreat for minister, young ministers, it's very inspiring to be around 60 people from around the country who are dedicated to the common good. And it reminded me, something that my cynicism had me forget, that when God created the earth, God called it good. When God created us, God called us good. Creation and we are essentially good, even if what we see around us does not reflect that. And God calls us back again and again to that goodness which we have within ourselves. That is a drumbeat we have. That responsibility to create and co-create the common good here, to care for the common good, and to create that in the world. And only with God and with each other will we be bold enough, optimistic enough, with the overwhelming discomfort of looking at the world as it is and dreaming of it as it could be. And in fact, using this place as a laboratory to create that. So what calls your name in the night? What makes you stand and say, here I am, like little Samuel did? And maybe you don't exactly get it right. Maybe you muddle yourself toward that call. Maybe you answer to the wrong person, like Samuel did with Eli. He said, here I am, but it was really God calling. There's a call in my life right now to be present for two of my friends Jean Montreville and Ravi Redbar, who have been detained, they're immigrants, they've been detained in New York last week while I was away, and they're likely going to be deported. So tomorrow, I'm going to New York to be with their community, to be with the ones who love them and who are pleading for them to come home. And I don't know if this is the right thing to do, I don't know if it will work at all to be part of an action that is calling for these two beloved children of God to stay here. But I have faith that God will help me muddle my way through. We all have a call on our lives for the common good. We often wait for it, wait for it to be just right. But I think sometimes we just have to act and say, here I am, and see what falls into place, to act from a place of faith, but also go into that place of not knowing, confident and trusting that God will be with us there. We are at a pivotal point in our human evolution right now. Does that ring true? We're in something called a hinge time. A time where we could go one way or another. Will we succumb to cynicism and allow it to pass us by? 
Or will we be willing to commit for the long haul to the care of the common good in this place and time? That will be challenging. At times it will be comforting. Sometimes we will have to recognize how we are complicit in the wounds of the world and constantly discern how we can become instruments of peace in a changing landscape. But this is a time where we are called to say, here I am. Will you say that with me? Here I am. Let this day be a reminder of your deep call to care for the common good, to create more good in the world in the unique way that only you know how. And let this be a day of celebration of the rhythms set forth by the first churchers 350 years ago to pave the way for those in 350 years to come, God willing. Here I am. Will you say it once more? Here I am. Let it be so. Amen. Amen.